Mark of Legacy Kitchen is simple. We offer numerous dishes like chicken enchilada soup, prime filet and loaded baked potato, baby back ribs, and so much more. At Legacy Kitchen, we serve American fare, crafted cocktails, and we offer a great selection of wines by the glass. Metairie at Vets and Martin Berman, and in the Warehouse District at Chapatulas and Girard. Located at 649 Yetta Avenue in Harvey, Louisiana is Logo Express. Logo Express provides custom embroidery, custom screen printing, and a large array of clothes and accessories. Our new equipment allows us to take care of multiple large orders in a short amount of time. Logo Express provides logos for reunions, social or business club events, school organizations, and even items to wear to work. Logo Express Marketing Inc right next to West Jefferson High School, 504-367-7393. Frenchie's Art Gallery, located on historic Oak Street beside the Maple Leaf Bar. With over 3,000 square feet of space, it features a large gallery front room and Frenchie's personal art studio. Frenchie's Art Gallery is also connected to the Maple Leaf Courtyard, which is ideal for the New Orleans night scene. Frenchie's Art Gallery, 8314 Oak Street. Yeah, you're right. So here's the bottom line. say that. Hey, by the way, this is our regular house band each and every week, led by Derek Freeman, of course. We got Devin Taylor right there over here, and of course, James Martin. This is the house band. We get him every week. This is the second show. Hey, good evening and welcome to Primetime Sports with Scott Alexander. And do we have a dandy for you? A lot of people say they have a great show. Trust me, we have a great show today. We have Hall of Famers left and right. We're going to start it off. Deuce McAllister, that's right. He's in a bunch of Hall of Fames, Saints Hall of Fame, Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame, etc. We're also going to have Ricky Jackson, the first and only one of two Saints in the NFL Hall of Fame. I cannot wait for this. Oh, by the way, how about basketball? We have the winningest coach in, in, in Louisiana history when it comes to college coaches. Dale Brown, 25 years with the Tigers, coached some of the greatest players to ever play in the SEC and NBA as well. I can't wait for Dale and Pelicans fans. I have Jake Madison. I know you love him. If you follow the Pels, I know you're on the Bourbon Street shots. Jake Madison is great. And as far as uh, this show, we're going to be talking sports, local and national. Hey, the combine started today. This is a big deal. This is, this is where everybody goes to get weighed, and this is a huge thing for the Saints. We know what they need, defense. When you finish second to last or last three of the last four years in defense, you need to get disruptive, destructive playmakers. Hey, also, don't forget, we're also going to be talking all sports. Deion Jones from LSU, meteoric rise of the combine. We're going to talk Pelicans and 59-point performance by Anthony Davis. Hey, LSU basketball. Kind of on the downswing right now with a two-game losing streak. Ben Simmons seems disengaged, and we got Keith Hornsby might be out for the season. But LSU baseball, Tulane baseball, UL baseball, all in the top 20, and UNO got a good start as well. It's Primetime Sports with Scott Alexander coming up next. Primetime Sports. A new team, new editorial resources. The same objective analysis of the top business news of the day. Every weeknight, complete market coverage. With the business and economic stories that are crucial to you. Nightly business report. Weeknights at 5.30 p.m. on WLAE. That's 
Derek Freeman in the MFG, our regular house band, and by the way, in the open. I told you this was our Hall of Fame show. Each one of these guys has been somewhere in the Hall of Fame, and the, my next guest, Deuce McAllister, is no stranger to that. Obviously, recently into the Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame, Saints Hall of Fame, Ole Miss Hall of Fame. He's probably in a few others that I don't know, but welcome to the show, Deuce. How you doing, man? Doing well. How you doing? Thank doing. you for having me on. Absolutely. And by the way, I mean, when I was with ESPN Radio, I did shows uh, at Deuce's Restaurant every Friday, and we had a great time over there. And if you're down in the quarter, Old St. Kitchen and Tap, great menu. Uh, great atmosphere and great, great, great 54 beers on tap. But just a great atmosphere to watch football games. But it's also a place you can bring your lady and she'll enjoy it just as much as you because the menu is high quality and they have chefs, not cooks. So there's your plug. I wanted to give that to you because I love your place. Well, no problem. Let me know how much I owe you for that as well <laughs> afterwards. We'll get together on that one. <laughs> hey, but uh, real quick, I have, I have to have some fun with you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, you, your nickname, Deuce. I knew you when you were still Delimus back in high school. I don't know if you remember this. I was doing that Countdown to Signing Day show. It was a, it was a national show out of Atlanta, but it was uh, a, a college football recruiting mm -hmm. show. And you were one of the best running backs coming out of Mississippi, a uh, small-town guy. And I just remember seeing the highlights, big bruiser, strong, glides on the field. And I remember it was Delimus, as far as I remember back then. I mean, I know, I know people might have been calling you Deuce, but – why not thrice? Isn't that a little better? Or, or quattro? I mean, how, how, how did it come about to be deuce? Well, I, uh, pretty much in my middle school years, I had a, uh, um, my middle school coach, he was a huge David Palmer fan, and, and, you know, obviously Alabama connection, you know, right there by Mississippi, and I was a second child. I wore the number two, I, I wore the number 34 as well, you know, um, just looking up to my idol, Bo Jackson, but um, he struggled saying Duwamis, and, you know, he, he was like, I, I'll tell you what, I'm going to call you Deuce, and, and from really there in middle school, it really just took off, and, um, you know, it, it was a little easier easier when you went to some of the different stadiums and the PA announcer you know he sees that well I'm gonna call him Deuce too and you know just from pretty much from there it stuck with me. By the way this guy obviously knows TV he's with CST he's looking at the camera he knew exactly where to go that's funny and by the way you're doing a fantastic job Thank I want to let people know that show Saints Tonight mm -hmm. uh, has become my go-to show I watch them all everybody knows I tape every one of these shows I watch them Paul Crane was on it before but you have Victor Howe, Scott Shanley, mm -hmm. uh, my man Mike Neighbors. I just want to give you ups on that. Phenomenal. Appreciate it. Thank you. Those guys do a good job. All right. Another thing, I, I, I kind of get off the beaten path on these things, and I've always wondered this, and I've never <laughs> asked you this, but um, once again, I didn't get the local news because I wasn't living here at the time, but take me through when you were a rookie this moment or this, this whole scenario that happened. Remember the name Albert Connell? Connell? Mm -hmm. All right. The, you know where I'm going with this. Mm -hmm. There was a big incident. He was, he was kind of a big get for them. I believe he might have been with the Redskins before. Whoever he was with, he – you know, he was a good receiver, and they were expecting some big things. There was the incident, and, I, and correct me if I'm wrong because I don't know the details, but they say $4,000 was taken. And I know rookies get pranked a lot, okay? And I know, I know that he might have said, hey, this was just a prank. But was it a prank to you at the time? Because no. $4,000 is a lot of money for anybody. Take us through that and uh, let me know how that, that genesis came about. Well, you know, as a competitor, there's a lot of different things that you do as guys. You know, you may say, hey, look, you know, this guy, I'm going to hit this shot, and you're not going to hit it. And so just go with me for, 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 for that moment. And then there was just an incident where, okay, we were in – in the locker room one Friday afternoon, I believe it was, and we were playing cards. And by playing cards, you know, hey, look, um, you, you, you're playing for money. Shouldn't have been doing it, but we were. And so um, – he, everybody does it. Correct. Like, okay. Everybody uh, does it, but still, you right. shouldn't have been doing sure. it. You know, uh, particularly that's that's where a lot of the veteran players, regardless of the sport, you know, take advantage of some of the younger players. And at the time, you know, I'm thinking it's the the fun thing to do, hanging out with the vets, playing cards with them. And this particular Friday, I did well and I won. And so, me not knowing any better. Um, I go and put the money into my car. And by doing that, I think that I locked the door. Well, I actually did. I don't remember the total details of, of, the, of, of, of that happening, but went in the car, took the money um, from me. It was on tape, you know, thought he was a friend, but, you know, you just don't, you don't do that to friends. And, you know, came back and said, nah, it was a prank. You know, that's not a prank. You know, that, <laughs> doing something like that, that's not a prank. So um, unfortunate situation, but as a rookie, you definitely learn, and you learn quick. 
Oh, I noticed he wasn't with the team a whole lot longer. Let's just say that. But, but you answered my other question. How did you have $4,000 with you? But now I, I got you one of the card game. Let me take you back to that year. That, that, let's go back to April of that year before mm-hmm. when you were drafted. Draft day, uh, most draft Knicks, and I was one of those guys, picked you as the second running back. Mm-hmm. And you ended up being that guy. Daniel mm-hmm. Thomason ended up being the fifth pick of the draft, which is interesting to me because that trade – on, you know, before the mm-hmm. draft with Michael Vick, everybody thought he was going to be a charger. Mm-hmm. Well, they had their mind on another guy that was picked in the second round, Drew Brees, Drew Brees. and they got the, the two for one on that one. They got LaDainian Tomlinson and him. But point being is most people had you projected around 10-11. I think you had a knee injury earlier that year, but you played afterward, and people were like, okay, maybe they're a little skittish on that, and you see the run going. I mean, you know, it kept going down. And the last thing I'm imagining is, that you think that the Saints are going to take you because they have a guy named Ricky Williams who was one of the greatest college running backs ever, just drafted a couple years before. So take us through this, and I want to, before I even get you there, do you remember kind of what you were doing when they got started getting down to 10? Maybe that's where you thought you were going to pick, and you're going through the preteens at 11, 12, and then into the teens. And then did you, did you kind of get up and walk away, or were you just glued to the TV the whole time? And then do you remember also the three guys that were picked right before you? You remember all of it. I mean, because that's your livelihood. You're looking at, you know, hey, look, where am I going to go and play? Where am I going to go and compete? Um, and to think, you know, I, I'll take you forward. Uh, this was the combine. You know, the combine was going on. Um, I, I remember vividly going and speaking to uh, Randy Mueller and I was speaking to Coach Hazlitt and never knowing. I said, you know, we didn't even talk. You know, normally um, teams with, with players that they are interested in, they'll go and talk to them, you know, 10, 15 minutes, spend a little time. I went by and shook their hands. You know, never thought that I'll fall to the 23rd pick to the New Orleans Saints. And then, you know, they had just traded. 19 picks just to get Ricky Williams, you know, uh, just, <laughs> just a couple, about. Okay. Yeah, well, not that many, but, but close, you know, so, yeah, right. but they had traded that many picks to get Rick. So, you know, there was no way that they would be picking another running back that soon. Um, but me, after pick number seven, I turned the TV off. I mean, because um, the teams that were picking didn't have a need for a running back from like seven to 11. Did you um, think you were going seven? No, I thought I was going top five. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Who, who who gave? That's a great question. Then, who gave you the indication? Was Cleveland. It, Cleveland. Okay. Cleveland. And Cleveland. Who did they take? Um, uh, big money. Gerard Warren. Gerard Gerard Warren from Florida. Uh, from, Not from a Florida. bad player. Yeah, yeah, from Florida. But what happened was that year the Super Bowl was the year that the Ravens had won the Super Bowl. Right. Right. And they had had so much success with Tony um, Saragusa. Saragusa right. and um, the other big defensive tackle. Uh, but what they did was to protect Ray Lewis. And so it's a copycat league. Sure and so the following draft year, there were like maybe eight, nine defensive linemen yeah. that went first round. And no one had predicted that going into it. So I had an opportunity to go to the draft. You know, and back then, they only invited maybe the top five to ten players. Uh-huh. And I, I'd always had that memory of that thought of, of looking back. I think it was Dante Hall, the running back from Texas A&M, that was stuck in that green room for, you know, almost – 10 hours, and I didn't want that to be me. I mean, because you got to remember, this was when the draft was 15 minute per pick. Right, right. And there was not taking a player out of the green room to save him from the embarrassment. You remember Aaron Rodgers, he got saved from some of that embarrassment. Took when, him out. Yeah, but they took him out. Back then, they were not taking guys out. You know, you just sat there. And so when Brady I Brady Quinn, same yeah, thing. Yeah, Brady Quinn was right. the same thing. So when I couldn't get a guarantee from, from, from Cleveland, from New England, and from San Francisco, who and, and Kansas City a little, but not a lot. But uh, those were the three that I thought that I had the best relationship with workouts and, you know, visits. When I couldn't get a guarantee from them, then I said, well, it may be best for me to just stay home, and long term it was. Well, we love it. You ended up being, in my opinion, the best running back in Saints history. By the way, the copycat league thing, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. When you said mm-hmm. that, the first thing I thought of was the Saints taking Stanley Jean Baptiste in the second round mm-hmm. thinking he was going to be the next Richard Sherman. Didn't work out. But uh, as far as last week, I did a, a graphic because I had Jabari Greer on the show mm-hmm. and I had Young Gun Delvin Bro, and I put my, my top cornerbacks of all time for the Saints on that list, and I've always loved Jabari. I had him one, and I had the young buck down there with a the question mark. Can he be there? Uh, as far as running backs, this is a premium list, in my opinion. And I'm an LSU guy, so, and I went to school with Dalton Hilliard. I played golf with Dalton. I played basketball with Dalton. I knew Dalton. 
be like a giant John F. Kennedy talking to Lloyd Benson. You are no Dalton Hilliard. <laughs> but, no, but I, mean, I love Dalton. I mean, he had the career with the Saints as well. Uh, but this list, man, uh, George Rogers, that first year he came out uh, after being the Heisman Trophy, gangbusters, Ricky Williams, enough said. Chuck Muncie was a personal favorite. He and Galbert together, thunder and lightning back in the late 70s when the Saints had some nice moderate success. Pierre Thomas, jack of all trades, your teammate for a bit there. Uh, and then Reggie Bush I put on there because, you know, he was almost as effective being a guy that you had to account for than mm-hmm. the great things he did. But you're at the top of that list, in my opinion. I've always said that. You're also at the top of another list that I love, in my opinion. Most beloved Saints of all time. I put you, Drew, and Archie on there. I keep saying it all the time. Um, what's it mean to you uh, when you see and you hear people talking like that? As you get older, you know, you respect it a lot more. When you're, when you're young, you're just going out and playing. You know, I had a lot of respect, obviously, for Ricky Williams and, you know, some of the things that he was able to accomplish. You know, I, I would go in and look at the records, you know, and you see George Rogers' name through there and you say, oh, I want to break his record. You know, I want to I want to do this. I want to do better than he did. And that's just com- com- competing. You know, you always want to go back and look. You know, you look at that list and it's, it's three Heisman Trophy winners, you know, on, on that list as far as running backs that have played for the Saints. So you just want your name mentioned with it you know everybody's opinion will vary and 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 that's okay you know as long as I could go out there and play the best of my ability that's all I could do by the way those three draft picks right before you and I memorize them all defensive backs interesting Adam Archuleta Adam Archuleta to St. Louis um Nate Nate Clements to Buffalo and um Giants uh a, a defensive back as well um Will Will, Will Will Hill. Will, Will, Will Allen. Allen. Will Allen. Our producer's Will, Will Hill. You got to plug, Will. Will, 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 Will Allen. Will um, Allen. You know, but uh, I, I can remember talking to Tampa Bay, and, you know, they took Kenyatta Walker. That was a place that I thought, you know, would, would possibly fit. You yeah. know, I remember talking to Kansas City and um, – I think they took a uh, – I can't remember who, exactly who Kansas City took, but I talked to them during the draft. You know, these were teams that called me during the draft. Minnesota called me during the draft. You know, they had to pick after the Saints, and they basically told me, if the Saints don't take you, we're taking you. You know, they end up taking Michael Bennett as a running back as well. But, you know, those were just some of the calls that you had during the draft. I had some great ideas along with some friends and thinking about some fun things to do. We were going to even play a big tic-tac-go-toe game with you and Ricky Williams. It was going to work out great. Uh, sometimes you have limitations, things you can do. Think, sometimes things go wrong. One of the things I was hoping last night at like midnight, my mind's churning on what, you know, what to talk about. And I, I, all of a sudden I'm thinking about, oh, goodness, I was just in a movie with a very small role. I was playing the part of Jim Henderson, basically, uh, along with Corey Johnson. We were, we were the voice calling a couple big plays. It, it, the movie ended – with uh, a positive thing, Steve Gleason, we're calling the great mm-hmm. play that kind of turned things around for not only New Orleans but the Saints as well, the city uh, and the rebirth. But the play kind of is the movie's called King of New Orleans, and it won best best movie at the New Orleans Film Festival. Uh, it's an interesting movie about a cab driver before and after Katrina. But one of the things that he almost has a heart attack is the River City Relay. He almost had a good kind of heart attack when he got the touchdown and the back kind when they had the missed extra point. I got to take you through this because six seconds left in the game, the Saints still have playoff hopes. It's game 15, uh, and, you know, they're 7-7 seven and seven at the time. And they have uh, Aaron Brooks throws the ball to Dante Stallworth, and it's the whole lateral thing. Everybody remembers the River City Relay. He laterals it off to Michael Lewis, and then Deuce McAllister gets it, and then... 24 yards at the end. He, he lads with Jerome Payton for the touchdown. Take us through this because the extra point was missed by a guy that hadn't missed one in his entire career, John Carney, one of the great NFL kickers of all time. But talk about the play and then talk about the motion after the touchdown and then after the missed extra point. Well, you just go to – you look at a play like that, you know, one of the things that A.B. goes into the huddle, hey, look, we need this play, you know, so I'm going to try to throw it as far as you can. Dante, you get open, Joe, you 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 get somewhere where he can find you. And, you know, for me, my original job on that play was to block, and so that's what I was doing. But once – I saw Dante make the catch and he's running across the field. I said, well, maybe I can get involved. You know, maybe he can toss it back. And, you know, we, we want to just try to continue to advance it, not knowing that he, he finds Mike. Mike doesn't make it really far, maybe four or five yards. And, you know, Mike is, I'm, I'm, I'm calling his name, Mike, Mike, I'm right here. Mike finds me, he throws it. And I, I probably don't even get three yards, you know, before uh, I, I, I just, 
You have glimpse. the best pitch, though. Yeah, I, I, you have I, the best pitch. I, 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 a glimpse, <laughs> and I, I, I see Don, um, I see Payton, Jerome yeah. Payton, and I see AB, and I felt like that I could get it over to Payton, and he catches it. He dives into the end zone, and you know we're 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 going crazy on the sideline. But but why we're doing that, and why they're reviewing the play? The refs are icing John Carney, you know, and so uh, uh, normally a two to three minute, maybe five minute review turned into 25 minutes and you know you never think of it in that terms but they basically ice Carney and you know he misses the extra point and you know we really couldn't even be upset you know he he had never missed an extra point you know and for for that to happen in that way uh you're kind of devastated but at the same time you shouldn't have been in that situation in the first place this is the second show we we have a new tradition here we're gonna fill up balls per year and you know we're gonna like last week Jabari Greer and Delvin Bro, we're on it as far as a couple other people. I want you to put your name on this ball. We're going to do this, and you're one of the first ones on it, sir. Saints Hall of Famer, Ole Miss Hall of Famer, Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame. This guy is one of the great, great football players of all time, in my opinion, and certainly one of the great people, Deuce. And you're well-loved, well-respected, and uh, I just want to thank you for everything you've done. No problem. Thank you. All right, there he is, Deuce McAllister. Hey, we're going to switch some gears right now. We're going to go talk Pelicans. Anthony Davis's big 59-point game with one of my favorites to talk to, Jake Madison from BourbonStreetShots.com. We're going to talk all things Pels. Coming up next right here on Primetime Sports with Scott Elliott. You're watching WLAE, New Orleans Public Television. Find us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Every show. That's Derek Freeman, the MFG. Hey, Devin Taylor, we missed him last week, but he's here. And, of course, James Martin. Not Jimmy. And, by the way, Derek was with Kermit Ruffins for years, and he's part of a bunch of projects. So check him out whenever you can. Derek Smoker, Derek Freeman, wherever you see that name, get out and see him live because they're great. I was just uh, watching him at a crawfish boil over at DBA the other day. Fantastic. Hey, I talked about this show being special. We have three Hall of Famers. I just had Deuce McAllister. He's in several Hall of Fames. Ricky Jackson coming up towards the end. Dale Brown, the head coach of LSU. But i got to be honest with you. I'm a hoops guy. You know that. And I've been looking forward to having my next guest right here. And he's going to be in a Hall of Famer somewhere, somehow. <laughs> Writer's Hall of Fame. Who knows TV in his future. His name's Jake Madison, BourbonStreetShots.com. And if you don't know about Bourbon Street Shots and you like basketball, get on it right now. In fact, wait till the end of the show. Write it down. Bourbon Street Shots, they know what they're talking about. And I've been on them since they started a few years back. Jake, welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to be here. Congrats on the new show and everything. This is going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, and then, by the way, if you did listen to the radio show uh, when I was on ESPN, Jake was a, a frequent guest. Obviously one of my go-to guys, particularly when it came to Pelicans or NBA talk in general. But when it comes to NBA and Pelicans, everybody in the league and all the shows for the last 48 hours have been talking about one guy and one performance, and that's Anthony Davis. He did what we've been waiting for him to do for a long time. 59 points, 20 rebounds, puts him in a stratosphere that it's only happened a few times, right? Elgin it's, Baylor back over 50 years ago, Will Chamberlain and Shaquille O'Neal, pretty select group. And since the modern NBA, when they started keeping track of the, the different stats and everything, only two other guys have done it, and it's Shaquille O'Neal, like you said, and Chris Webber, and now Anthony Davis. And this is what I think everyone was expecting all season long. He was supposed to be the MVP candidate this year. Right. Has kind of flown under the radar, even though he's averaging 24 and 10 a game, and then he has this monster game, and everyone starting to take note of him again and you've got to he's got to realize the spotlight back on him and he needs to carry this Pelicans team down this stretch run yeah in fact that that C Webb didn't get up to 59 I was putting that category but still the 20th player in history think about this 70 years of NBA basketball only 19 other guys has scored at least 59 points and he's only 22 years of age people uh by the way this is going to segue you're too young and you're an LA guy he's, Jake for those of you who don't know is a two-lane grad from Los Angeles, came back and made his living in the other L.A. because he loved it so much, Louisiana, and he's here for a while. Hopefully he stays for good. But back when I was a kid, 
I'm 12 years old, right? I might have even been 11 because uh, my birthday went to later. I was at a game I still call the, the greatest game I've been ever at because I'm a basketball guy, Pistol Pete Fanatic. Well, Pistol Pete Maverick scored 68 points against my second favorite player of all time, Walt Frazier, and the Knicks. I'll never forget this game, this performance. But I'm going to put up a graphic, in my opinion, of some of the greatest performances, single game in history. Now, three of those are kind of moments. Uh, T- Dempsey hit the 63-yarder. I'm a five-year-old kid. I was there, Tulane Stadium, to beat the Lions at the end of the game. That stood for, what, 40 years? So that's a moment that stood around for a long for moments in New Orleans, Steve Gleason, block punt against the Falcons in the rebirth of the Superdome. Tracy Porter, of course, sealing the Super Bowl with that interception. Also, he got one in the previous game against Favre to help go to overtime. But when you're looking at Drew Brees, you know, he had that seven-touchdown game. And we could probably put about ten of his accomplishments because he's done so many. But the, he just did that this, this year uh, against the Giants. And Eli Manning, who threw six, you see that right there. But when I talk about the, 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 the enormity of what Anthony Davis has just done and the potential and hope that it provides, is this a little bit of a ray of hope for this franchise who this, this month and the whole season, it's been a big disappointment. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, you want your best player to have these moments to, you know, to take over a game, which is something he's not known for doing. One of the big criticisms criticisms of him is he hasn't been that leader on the court. And now going out and having a game where he completely dominates, doesn't come out of the game, has a great shooting night. He had a true shooting percentage of like 76%. 24 or 34. Is absolutely insane. Uh, you want him to do this. He's had some quiet games this year, games where he only posted 10 points, something like that. So for him to realize his potential and start to live up to it and what's been kind of a largely lost season for the Pelicans is giving give people and fans something to look forward to over the next 27 games or so. There's still a lot to play for out here. It's not entirely a lost season. They still have a chance at the playoffs. And with Tyreek Evans being out injured for the rest of the year, with Eric Gordon still being out, with some of the guys not reaching you know the levels they should, Holiday, being on somewhat of a minutes restriction, not playing full games, coming off the bench. You need Anthony Davis to take over this team and have those dominant star player moments. Kobe's known for doing it. Other players in the league do it. We haven't seen it from Davis just yet, and now it seems like he's woken up. And don't forget, in his contract, he's got that Derrick Rose rule. Yes, yes. He has 23 million extra reasons to play this hard coming down the stretch. He needs to make an all-NBA team, first, second, or third. Putting up games like this is going to help him earn his money. Didn't hurt. Hey, by the way, I said... Listen, it was a long shot. There was uh, the odds makers put it at 5% at the All-Star break that the Pels made the playoffs. I personally put it at 15 because I knew that they had a group coming together. Eric Gorman's going to come back, and we're going to try to see this thing without Tyreek Evans. He really didn't fit the system. That in a second. But my, my question thing was, there were six and a half back. You had seven or eight weeks. If you try to gain a game a week, and it's unlikely, right? We know that. But the, since the All-Star break, I'm going to say what Anthony Davis did at the All-Star game, 12 or 13, 24 points, 12 of 13. And I know he had a lot of dunks, but he does shoot as well. Remarkable. He came back with a 34-point performance against the Sixers, a game you should win, right? And then he had this great game. Now they're five and a half back, five in the loss column. And this was last year at this time, it was four. It's not like it's crazy talk. It's unlikely, but it's not impossible. Do we have a ray of hope for playoffs? I mean, there, there's a ray of hope, but it, it's definitely going to be a harder shot than it was last year. Don't forget, the only other team they were competing with last season was the Oklahoma City Thunder. Here, there's more teams in the way. You've still got the Kings. you still got the Jazz. A little bit of Suns last year, but you yeah. You know, Suns, exactly. So it was. it's not quite the same as last year. They've still got more hurdles to jump for in addition to being more games back. They can still do it. Their schedule eases up tremendously this second half of the year. Their final 13 games, they have a chance to go 12-1. and one. You need to make up a couple of games really quickly. You can do it right there. And, you know, this team believes they can make the playoffs. This front office believes they can make the playoffs. They're not going to be tanking anytime soon. They're not going to be losing games on purpose that I know a lot of fans have wanted to see for a chance to draft someone like Ben Simmons. But there's still a lot to play for. You kind of, you know, evaluate this team going forward. Are these the guys you want? Are these the players you're going to keep next year? Or do they need to shake this roster up some? Speaking of that, listen, we know that, I've said this before, the definition of insanity is doing things over and over and expecting a different result, right? Well, I've been a proponent of the continuity of the team just because, I mean, when they do play together, as you saw at the end of the season, things happen. They beat San Antonio and Golden State to get in the playoffs. Two teams that, you know, are pretty, pretty impressive. Now, I have to throw the injury thing out there because it, it sounds like an excuse, but when you're talking about the last five years of this franchise has been snake bit, it's almost just been unreal. By far the most injuries of any team. Eric Gordon's goes back 
five years, okay? And he's been healthier lately, but, you know, he missed a bunch of early bomb, but still that 57 he missed in the first season, he still missed 100 since then, right? Uh, and, and that's actually uh, five years. This would be his fifth. Uh, the, the reason you have asterisks by Holiday is that he has missed 96, but he's had to play limited minutes in another 30, right? So there's a bunch more. Uh, Tyreek Evans, I'm, I'm including the rest of the season because he's out for the rest of the season. That Him and uh, Holiday in three years. Anderson in four years has missed 84. And AD, I put 53 with the asterisks because he gets hurt a lot in the beginning of the game. So you can add at least a dozen more over the last four years with him. So this team has an excuse. No, they do. It's not the only excuse, and it's not something that excuses this entire season, but it certainly hurts you. You're missing Tyreek Evans the rest of the year, a guy who maybe didn't fit too well, but is still an important player, a guy who can still score, get to the line, get to the rim, and you need him like that. You need shooting on any NBA team in the, in the modern NBA now, and missing Eric Gordon for a number of games after he finished last season shooting incredibly well from deep really hurts. And, you know, this team goes as far as Anthony Davis is going to take him, and he's missed a couple of games the good thing about his injuries is they're not recurring. They're things, you know, with, with a shoulder, with a concussion, with a bruised back, whatever it is. It's not all the same, and that's kind of the important thing. But he still missed a lot of games, and it hurts. You know, but the, the bigger thing is you don't want to look at it fully as an excuse. They're still making a lot of the same mistakes yep, no that doubt. they shouldn't make. No doubt. No Defensive doubt. rotations have been off all year, and even as a backup, you need to know where to be. And when you're making the same mistake over and over and over again, that's when you've got to look at the coaching staff and Gentry and, and fault them for certain things as well. Effort's been an issue this year. That's on the coach. And so, it, you know, it takes it, it's a combination of a lot of things. I'm going to make a promise to you. I'm going to bring you on a show in about a month when we don't have three Hall of Famers. I'm going to have a 20 to 25 minute segment because I love talking hoops with this guy. I don't have time today, but when we get in that little 12 and one run, we're going to do this before I let you go. I know it's not a basketball, but it's a new tradition. Sign this ball for me and we're going to have this thing and I'm going to you know, get, get down right up there, the fat part, put it over there and I'm going to have all my guests sign a little bit of a tradition that we're going to start right here. Uh, I was looking for the hoop ball for you to sign, guys <laughs> like Dale Brown, but we'll do that next. But I appreciate you coming on. But coming up next, yeah, we already had Deuce McAllister. We got Ricky Jackson later. But next, LSU Hall of Fame coach Dale Brown. Coming up next right here on Primetime Sports. North Shore Sportsplex is a basketball training center located at 70239 Highway 59 in Abita Springs, Louisiana. Here we offer developmental programs for all ages, focusing on structure, hard work, effort, and teamwork. North Shore Sportsplex also has year-round basketball teams, leagues, camps, training, speed and agility conditioning, and other programs to help enrich our students. North Shore Sportsplex. 985-373-7367, NorthShoreSportsplex.com. Located at 109 Wall Boulevard in Gretna, Uniforms by Logo Express provides school uniforms, medical wear, hospitality wear, safety and industrial wear, and so much more. We offer a number of locations on both sides of the river. Two in Chantilly, one in Woodmere, and our main store located in Gretna. Uniforms by Logo Express. Your brand starts here. Uh, welcome back, Crescent City. We're halfway through. Hey, great show so far. Deuce McAllister and Jake Madison obviously talking some Pelicans. And that, of course, is the house band here every week, Derek Freeman. In the MFG, Martin Freeman Genius. Hey, the, my next guest is a guy that I go way back with, three decades, in fact, to my time at LSU. And I consider him a second father figure, one of the great guys I know on this planet. His name is Dale Brown. <laughs> and for you younger generation out there, just a little, little history lesson for you. He came to LSU in 1972, a couple years after the Pistol Pete era. And he was there for 25 years. In fact, two-time National Basketball Coach of the Year. Uh, he's also a guy that went to two Final Fours with a highly, uh, you know, a team that was a favorite in 1981. They got to the Final Four to lose the eventual champion. And a team that was a huge underdog at the time, the, the lowest seed ever to get to a Final Four in 1986. And that was a fun ride right there. Dale Brown also, by the way, third leading uh, as far as wins go in SEC history. In fact, until just a year or two ago, Billy Donovan passed him. Only Adolph Rupp 
in the entire conference had more wins. But Dale Brown is a better guy off the court than he was even as a coach, a guy that looked for Bigfoot and Noah's Ark, and they called him the master motivator. They also called him preacher man. And I'm going to say one thing. He was one of the greatest, greatest recruiters of all time. We'll get into that in a second. But Dale, welcome back to the show. And I say welcome back because you've been on my radio show a bunch. First time I've had you on TV with me since back in 2004 when you came to Atlanta and you were one of the living legends of the SEC. But it's great to have you back. How are you, bud? That is when you lost the race to me. Would you like to put that down on the escalator or not? By the way, by the way, I had hard shoes and you were in tennis shoes, but... And okay. just since you brought that up, Coach, we ran up, we ran up in, in an escalator, and this is one of those like triple escalators. It was like literally 100 yards I up. I know. And Dale what wanted a, to run. What, what, what a dope. You know, um, thank you for those most gracious comments. And every time I get a nice comment or compliment like that, I always think of John Wooden, how gracious he always was. I mean, here's the greatest coach in the history of the game. And this, this is the paramount example, how he, how he responded to a nice compliment which you delivered to me. We were sitting in T.J. Ribs one day, the owner, Tom Moran, myself, and John Wooden having lunch. I saw a gentleman off to the side, dressed neatly, about 40 years old, and standing looking at us. Well, he came over, and he said, Coach Wooden, excuse me. He said, I hate to interrupt you. He said, I don't want an autograph. I don't want a picture. I don't want to shake your hand. I know you're busy. I hope it's not rude of me. I just want to tell you this. Coach Brown, I mean, Coach Wooden, you are one of God's angels. You are my hero. You're a legend. You're how we all should live our lives. Thank you, Coach Wooden. And he was going to turn, and the young man stopped him. What's your name, young man? Whatever it was, Scott Alexander. Scott, he said. (laughs) That was so nice what you just said. It made an old man feel good. Before, but before you leave, Scotty, I think you should know this about me. I'm not what I ought to be. I'm not what I could be. And I'm certainly not what I should be. But I'm sure glad I'm not what I used to be. But you made me feel good. Thank you. Most people will just kind of, you know, I'm humbled by that or something. He always was so much more gracious than the person being gracious to him. So... Hey, by the way, for the younger set real quick, John Wooden, of course, dynasty at UCLA, lived to be 100 years old. They won, gosh, what, nine, ten titles back in the 60s and 70s, Coach. Since you're on him, I was going to talk about him anyway. Hey, how did that relationship develop? I mean, I know you were a young assistant coach back in the day when he was still in his prime at UCLA. When did you two become friends, and then, you know, when did he become a mentor to you? We became friends when I was an assistant at Utah State. We had a real good team. And either UCLA or us were going to go to the Final Four. It looks like we were going to be in the region. So I was out recruit, scouting them. And I'd, he'd never, I'd never met him or anything before. And I came up behind the bench before the game they were playing, and I said, Coach Wooden, I said, my name's Dale Brown. I'm the assistant at Utah State. And instead of just turning around and waving, he got up, oh, Dale. And he reached over to shake my hand. Nice to meet you. How long have you been at Utah State? And I thought, gee, many Christmas, that's kind to him. Well, we had no more correspondence. In 1972, when I got this job at LSU, I thought, I don't want to blow this. This is an opportunity of a lifetime. I've got to learn from the best. So I'm talking not only in sports, but in business, in uh, public speaking, you name it. Well, the, obviously, the giant in coaching, there was none equal to him, was John Wooden. So I called him, went out and spent four wonderful days with him and a whole list of questions I asked him, and we almost bonded immediately. And so as a result, 44 years he was my mentor. i got to tell you, I I have a picture right now of you kissing his forehead when obviously he's later in life. It's wonderful. Hey, Coach, I want to get to the recruiting aspect real quick because there was none better than you. I mean, listen – Uh, I have a graphic right now showing just some of the guys. In fact, this list I have up here doesn't even include, you know, some other guys that were number one, two, or three. But guys like Shaquille O'Neal, obviously, uh, he ended up being one of the greatest players of all time. Chris Jackson, uh, you know, Duran Macklin. We go to John Williams, who's the number one player coming out of Los Angeles that year. Talk about recruiting this group from different eras. I mean, also Howard Carter, Randy Livingston, who was also number one the year he came out, his teammate Ronnie Henderson, Stanley Roberts. That's an incredible list, Coach. Well, I think it all started the first time I I got the job at Utah State. 
it was the weekend I got the job, and I'm in the coach's office. So he was telling me my responsibilities, and one of them was director of recruiting. And I said, Coach, I don't know anything about recruiting. How do you do it? Where do you go? This is, this is up in the mountains in Mormon country. He said, well, that's why I hired you. We've had some losing seasons, and we don't have good enough players. So I went back in the little old cracker box office I had, and I opened up the U.S. map. And I thought, where should I go? What should I do? Well, my gravitated back to the little old state of North Dakota, which only had 600,000 people. I knew Utah was not a camping grounds to us to camp out in because BYU and Utah were going to get the best players. So I thought, hey, I'm going to go to New York, and I'm going to go to California. So I started out like that. Well, anyway, the first home I went in, I thought, now what am I going to say? I didn't, I didn't have a script. I didn't know what to do. I rang the doorbell, totally unprepared. The mother came to the door, went in and sat down with the mom and the dad and the young boy. And I said, you know, I'm new on this job. And I said, I know what, the, I know what things that should be said or are going to be said. Well, if you come to school, you're definitely going to graduate. We have beautiful girls. We have a great schedule. We have a great arena. You can play in the NBA. I can't make those promises because I don't know that yet. But I can make you a promise, Mrs. Alexander. I'm here recruiting a human being first and a basketball player second. So if you will entrust your son to me, I give you my word that I will, 25 years from now, I will be his friend. I'll be in contact with him. Well, I lie. It's been 44 years, and I'm still in contact with all the players. And I think... It wasn't. It was no gimmick. I really meant what I said. And then I think when they saw the need, at first we could not get black athletes to visit LSU. And the reason LSU was the last really bastion of racism, didn't recruit only one black athlete, Collis Temple. And there were numerous homes I went into. And the father or the grandfather would tell me, Coach, I'm not interested in my son or grandson going to LSU because I tried to go to LSU and wanted to play at LSU. I couldn't even get enrolled in LSU. They didn't allow blacks. So it was not an easy task, but I kept on just persevering. I also was never fearful that I would fail because if I did fail, I wouldn't feel like a failure if I did my best, and that's what I tried to do. And I could always go back to North Dakota and be a high school principal and head basketball coach and teach five subjects and get $5,000 a year. Coach, one of the things you just said has always struck me because this is a fact, and I tell people this, they don't believe me, but I know it because I've been around you a lot. Even when I was an agent, we were, told, we were having lunch every time I went to town to Baton Rouge. You, the last guy on the bench, was a guy like me, and then the superstars like Shaquille O'Neal, you know where they all are, but I want to talk about that Shaq relationship because the SEC network just had that great piece, Shaq and Dale, and, you know, I, I've been showing a couple pictures of you two as your relationship when you were at LSU and since then. Talk about how special this is. And then, and listen, Shaq's a special person, special player. He's a unique guy. But just talk about, you know, I know how you recruit. Everybody knows the story in Germany when he was 13 years old. But talk about how it's, you know, just kept on fostering itself over the years. I think uh, Hannah Storm, the producer of the show, she should get all the credit for the positives of the show because when she first called me out of the blue sky no correspondence prior she said they had left a staff meeting a day or two ago and she said she brought up the idea they're looking for uniqueness in this 3030 and she said as a result she said it hit me like a ton of bricks you and Shaquille have been close friends almost son and father for 30 plus years. You met him 13 years, when he was 13 years old up in the mountains. She said, we'd like to do a documentary on you two. Would you be interested? And I said, well, I would. Well, would, you, would you call Shaq, see if he was interested? He was. So the first time she met with us in Baton Rouge, she met, I think she met with me individually in Baton Rouge, Shaquille individually in Florida where he lives. Then we met together in Baton Rouge. She gave us no script, Scott. She said, Tell me what happened when Shaquille landed. What happened? I said, well, the first thing he did, I brought him to my home. Well, let's live that over. And then where, where did Shaquille, uh, how about where he lived? He lived in an apartment dorm. I said, he lived in a little old crampy dorm room. Well, let's go do that. 
where do you hang out? I said, he is favorite spot. He loved the quad. He could wave at the girls, shake people's hands, and he was a little shy then, stuttered, but he loved it there, and he became a hero there. Well, what else did he do? So not, not once did she say, stop, redo. And I think that her, her great ability to be a great producer, she's a Steven Spielberg in her area. Well, Coach, I got to tell you, I could do this all day long. I have about 20 more questions I wanted to get, but you and I will have lunch next time I get up to Baton Rouge. I just want to thank you so much, and we'll talk to you soon, buddy. Scott, thank you, and congratulations on your new show, and I heard you got half the Western Hemisphere on in the next <laughs> week or so. We do have some of them. I appreciate I it, Coach. It. Take Thanks, care, Scott. my man. Love you. Yep, and he speaks of, well, my next guest. That's going to be Ricky Jackson. That's right, the NFL Hall of Famer. Some say the greatest to ever wear. The black and gold. Who might argue with that? Hey, coming up, Ricky's next, but I got Derek Freeman in the MFG. Fridays at 7 p.m. on LAE. I don't want to say we're saving the best for last, but we're saving our Hall of Famer in the NFL for last. And he's been in so many Hall of Fames, he can't even remember all of them. I know Louisiana Sports Hall of Fame, of course, his college team, the college football, NFL Hall of Fame, the very First player from New Orleans Saints, and only one has been since, and his name's Willie Rope. But my guest, Ricky Jackson, number 57. Oh, my pleasure. Everybody knows you well. Ricky, I'm going to go off the, off the grid on this first question. Uh, you probably haven't been asked it a whole lot, but I was just curious because I've always spelled your name a couple different ways. My son in high school changed his Zach from Z-A-C-K to Z-A-C-H. You do the same thing with Ricky. Yeah, I changed mine, too. I mean, tell me, tell me how that all happened, man. I just like the uh, EY, you know what I mean? You hear the key better, you know? So <laughs> I just like, so I just changed it to EY. So you hear the key better? Right. K-E-Y? Is right. that why all the kids have a Ricky, former Ricky? All right. So <laughs> I'll name them all of them after me. Uh, Rakia, give me some other names. Uh, Rakeem, Rakivas, you know, <laughs> just put them out to me. Makes it easy. All right. Hey, uh, let's talk real quick about one of the things. Saints fans will remember this if you're hardcore back from the 80s. Obviously, Ricky was in that great 81 draft. Before I get to that draft, there's something that you always used to do, and I had to be reminded of it. Somebody's like, do you remember the towels? The towels was a big thing. When he had the towel that would hang down, you know, tucked in his jersey, and we have a picture of one here. It says the slammer, Okay. Now, talk about that real quick, but also I want to have a towel. I really want you to explain because you had a towel that had a frowny face on it, right? Like, you know, and then you had the word Y-O-U, you. Right. So talk about that. And was that planned for any particular player? Or is that just whoever was in front of you? Well, you know, we had one coach <laughs> used to crawl all the time. So when I put the face on that, that was for him. And uh, I used to always have one for Joe Montana. You could see the ones when we get ready to play the 49er. I would put Joe on the towels and stuff. So it was just – Different thing to motivate you uh, for the game. Did they ever comment like a Montana? Obviously, he was the albatross for the Saints for a long time. The Saints, as good as they got, couldn't seem to get by Montana. But he always said, you know, he and Steve Young, they said that y'all always gave him the best games. But, I mean, did he ever comment or anybody like that? Yeah, I mean, you know, every time uh, I always played Joe, you know, he always would, you know, try to take the towel from me at the end or something, you know. So, you know, that's, that's what I always did. I just put – the quarterback on the towel a lot of time. Whoever I was focused on that game, I would put on the towel. I want to talk about that draft in 81. The Saints obviously were 1-15, in 15, not very good, uh, but there's a lot of linebackers that were taken ahead of you. I mean, look, look at this list, and I'm going to go over this real quick. It's Lawrence Taylor, some say the greatest of all time, regardless of position. Uh, he speaks for himself. E.J. Jr. from Alabama was big in college. Good pro. Hugh Green, your teammate. And I'm going to get into that in a second. Obviously, he was a guy that they were considering for Heisman Trophy. He was even on the cover of Sports Illustrated. But here's the Rams' two picks. Mel Owens and Jim Collins. I don't know a whole lot about him, and I study football. If the Rams had uh, picked you instead of those two, they might have stayed in Los Angeles originally. Yeah, but I was glad, you know, the Saints took me, uh, took me because I didn't really want to be out there for You know what I mean? My, my whole thing, I was from Florida. Right. So New Orleans was a lot closer for me and better for me to get home and stuff. I, I really wasn't ever a West Coast guy. I went to the University of Pittsburgh, you know, stayed on the East Coast. But 
West Coast one, that was my cup of tea. Well, did that give you incentive? I mean, listen, uh, you know, you weren't even the, the first guy picked on from your team. No, no offense. I mean, Hugh Green was the guy that was on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Uh, they were talking about him possibly being the first defensive Heisman Trophy winner. Didn't work out, but he got picked with the seventh pick. You had, obviously, a Lawrence Taylor out of North Carolina getting picked. And then you start falling back. A lot of linebackers picked early, and then they had a little rush towards around where you were. What were you thinking that whole draft and how much motivation that give you? Well, I didn't worry about that because we had Mark May taken in the first round, Randy McMillan took a, uh, in the 10th pick. Mark May was taken by the 7th pick. Hugh Green was like the 8th pick. So University of Pittsburgh had a lot of guys to go in the first round that year. But I knew I was going to get picked in the you know top two rounds. It was always you know talking about late first or uh, 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 early second. So you know, it didn't make no difference who I was going to go to. I know I was going to be a, a star, so that's what it count. And this is why I don't script questions, because you brought all those great players from Pittsburgh, and you guys were a dynasty back then, even right. before you was Tony Dorsett. But there was a quarterback that was a couple years behind you. Did you have any idea that Dan Marino – and I, listen, everybody wants to talk about greatest quarterbacks of all time. They talk about, you know, you have to win a title or two. He didn't win one, but I'm going to tell you, if I need a, ball, a guy to sling a ball – there's none better than Dan Marino, your college teammate. And I, you know, I used to go to his house and eat all the time. You know, what I mean, <laughs> that, that, that was my, that was, you know, he stayed right down the street from the campus, so we was the best friends, and I always went down there and eat. And uh, mom and dad always had food for us when we got there, so it was like home for me. Like Italian food, I'm sure, right. Marino, all, right, all baby? Italian food, so that I was home for me. My junior, senior, I, I stayed there eating all the time. All right, I want to get back to the draft, okay? Because. Uh, a lot of people talk about you know the younger set that that doesn't remember back to 1981. We, the Saints have had uh, not a lot of success lately. Last year was a pretty good draft, and hopefully it'll be great. 2006 is the one everybody around here wants to talk about. You know, look at the list: Reggie Bush, perhaps one of the greatest decoy running backs of all time. I mean, he had moves I've never seen. Roman Harper still starting in the NFL. Jari Evans obviously is going to find a greener pasture, but 10 years, six-time Pro Bowler. Ninkovich started on a Super Bowl champion the year before last, and he's still starting for the Patriots. Streif and Colston's careers were amazing. Uh, Colston obviously set a bunch of records. But your draft, now it helped a little bit that you got the first pick because the Saints – were in 78 and 79, were 79 and 8 and 8, looking like they were going to be on a meteoric rise with Archie Manning doing well, then the 1 and 15 season. So they had the first pick that year. They got a guy named George Rogers who blew up immediately out of South Carolina, the Heisman Trophy winner. But I, back to that list, though, because I want people to see this. Russell Gary from Nebraska was a big-time defensive back. Obviously, Ricky Jackson speaks for himself, Hall of Famer. Uh, Frank Warren, uh, longtime defensive uh, tackle and starter on the team. Hobie Brenner, seemed like he started for two decades. Louis Oubre out of Oklahoma, and even a couple more on that list. All right, we had Hogan, uh, Hogan Gajon right now from Baton Rouge from uh, LSU. He was a stud. I mean, you know, uh, Jim Frank, Wilkes. Yeah, had Jim Wilkes. I mean, longtime starter. Right, Frank Wilder. So we had a lot of good guys, and then Dave Wilson came in the supplemental draft that year, number one quarterback, you know, from Illinois that year. So we had a lot of great players, but uh, you know, looking at that class with um, you know other class with two hundred six class, they they got the chance to get to a Super Bowl, and uh, you know that 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 was great for them. You know, knowing that you know all those guys they was here long enough to get on that Super Bowl team, so that was good for that class too. Hey, I got to talk about Dome Patrol. Obviously, uh, the greatest, in, in some say. In fact, the NFL Network has put this out: greatest four man linebacker crew of all time. Only time that you have four guys from the same team at the same position start together in a pro bowl i mean you guys could win games on your own you say hey, listen just hold the defense hold the, hold the other team to 12 points or less bobby Avery will get you a couple touchdowns we'll win the game talk about that team and those teammates and, and i'm gonna bring up this greatest linebacker uh, graphic because to me and this is only my opinion i think those four are, are still the greatest linebackers in Saints history. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, not on the Saints history, I mean in the NFL history. I mean, anytime you get four guys in, in, in the same position go to the Pro Bowl, I mean, at one time, that was, that was amazing for all of us to be out on the field at the same time. And, you know, you get a lot of publicity from outside and, and all that, but a lot of those guys, they deserve to get publicity right here in New Orleans. And I'm still waiting on that for some of those guys to get recognized. You know, for me, I'm in the Hall of Fame. It don't, it don't make a difference. But for Sam, Vaughn, and, and Pat, those guys, they, they, they deserve a lot better than what they've been getting. So I'm just waiting on the accolades to come to them too. I mean, should they be Hall of Famers? Well, I mean, you know, Hall of Famer is, is, is hard to say. But I know that, you know, for, for here locally, you know what I mean, 
they, they should be pushed a little more, you know what I mean? You can't, the Hall of Fame is something that you don't have no control over, but locally, you know, them guys need to be recognized a little more. Uh, one of the guys at the bottom of that list, Stefan Anthony, it, it kind of, I know he's not outside linebacker like you, he's playing inside, but he's side to side. I have a question mark, I am just like I had a question mark about Delvin Bro because it's incomplete, you can't put him in there yet, but kind of like you, Hugh Green got all the accolades, right? Uh, well, he was playing with a guy, I believe it was, uh, you know, uh, Beasley. Vic Beasley was the other guy who was the eighth pick with the Falcons. He was later. Did that give you incentive with Hugh Green being up there? And, like, do you think it might be working for Anthony? Because he had a great rookie year. No, I did not worry about that because those guys was college players and stuff, but I know the NFL is a whole different ball game. And I feel like my style was more NFL. I was going to be uh, great in the NFL. And I'm sure he felt the same way. And just looking at for me to have 125 tackles my rookie year and for him to break that, I mean, I, I let you know uh, right there that, you know, he's a stud and he's going to be a great ball player. And he's playing in the middle, you know. I just hope that they get some big enough guys in the front to protect him because he can really play football. I look for him to be, as you get older and get smart, he'll be like the guy from uh, North Carolina, Luke Lee, you know what I mean? He'll be oh, a lot, like yeah, that. yeah. Right, so, you know, and he got the speed and, he, and, he, and you can see he got the toughness. So Good I like call. Him. Good call on that. Hey, I got to bring up the Hall of Fame. I mean, listen, I, I'm not going to lie. I cried like a baby when you were inducted. Uh, the day you got elected, the Saints won the Super Bowl the next day. I kind of believe in these karma things. Uh, look at this picture right there. Give me the memory it brings back. Of course, that's Tom Benson. And the, uh, there's a Steve Perry, the head of the uh, Hall of Fame over there. And then, the, of course, there's your bust. Well, it's for the fans. You know what I mean? I really enjoy it. The fans of New Orleans, they really took me in 1981 as one of their guys, you know, and, and it just always, anything that you did, you know what I mean, you shared it with them and they really cared about me. And that was just great to just to have them, you know, celebrate uh, with me. Just the love that the fans have, I'm gonna close on this, because you're the only guy they could have rooted for when San Francisco is beating our brains in, or at least sometimes it was always at the end of the game. But you go and, you know, I think it was your first year, you get there, you get the Super Bowl championship. Uh, that moment was great, and we all became 49er fans. All right. I mean, it's just like uh, Evan, you know what I mean? He got to go play somewhere. I mean, once the team don't want you no more, I mean, you know, you, uh, he feel like he got a couple more years left, so he got to go play somewhere. So wherever he go, the Saints not going to hate that team because he went there because they know that he lost it here and he wanted to be here, but, you know, it was just his time up. And for you youngsters under 25, the 49ers were in the Saints division with the Los Angeles Rams and Atlanta Falcons back in the day, and the 49ers just seemed to be the team they couldn't get by. Ricky Jackson, one of my favorites. This is an honor for me. I appreciate you coming on. Well, thank okay. you for having me. Absolutely. Hey, we're going right. to go back. Derek Freeman in the MFG. Coming right back. Nights at midnight on LAE. Hey, I want to thank everybody. Ricky Jackson, Deuce McAllister, Dale Brown, and of course Jake Madison as well. And of course our band, Derek Freeman in the MFG. And by the way, if you're Saints and Pelicans fans, please come to my site. I've got updates every day on SaintsInsider.com. PelicansPride.com. I'm part of Scout.com, so I'm part of that big family. Saints, Pelican stuff all the time. Hey, next week we got Bobby Bear, former Tennessee coach basketball, Donnie Tindall, and I got a nice big surprise as well. It's going to be a fun show next week. Primetime Sports with Scott Alexander. Mm -hmm.